Alison Gray from NVIDIA. Can you please come to the stage? <laughs> Alison is a solutions architect at NVIDIA, supporting customers using GPUs for deep learning. Prior to joining NVIDIA in 2014, Alison was a research engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory where she researched non-imaging optics for concentrated solar power systems. Ms. Gray has received both bachelor's and science and master's of science degrees in mechanical engineering from UNLV and a master's of science in imaging science from Rochester Institute of Technology. Allison loves dogs and rescued a retired racer. They both love running and training fast. <laughs> Our next panelist is Douglas A. Palmer. May you please come to the stage. <laughs> Dr. Palmer specializes in technology solutions util utilizing digital signal processing, high-speed digital network, application-specific integrated circuits, and real-time computer software. With over a dozen patents, he has founded several startup companies and is currently the Chief Technology Officer at New Edge. Dr. Palmer received his Master's of Philosophy and PhD in High Energy Physics from Yale University. Our next panelist is Dr. Victor Lee. May you please come to the stage. Dr. Lee is a principal engineer in Intel's data center group and leads the HPC ecosystem application team, HEAT. He joined Intel in 1997 and has worked on Intel Pentium Pro, Pentium 4, and Itanium processors. At Intel Labs, he spearheaded Intel's integrated core architecture and for the first Intel Xeon 5 co-processor product. His research interests are applications of machine learning, artificial intelligence to the solutions to improve HPC and as well as revolutionary computer architectures. Victor is a senior member of the IEEE and has 40 plus professional publications, 15 granted patents and more than 30 pending patents applications worldwide. And our final panelist is IBM's Scott Sutter. May you please come to the stage. Scott Sutter is an offering manager with IBM's Cognitive Systems Business. With responsibility for solutions in high performance computing, high performance data analytics, and deep learning. During his 20 year career with IBM, Scott has been a global cluster sales executive for high performance and technical computing. A sales specialist for IBM's Unix customers, and Scott holds a BA degree in anthropology and an MBA with a focus on organizational change. Mr. Sutter resides in Portland, Oregon with his family, and in his spare time, he enjoys fly fishing, amateur photography, and recreational swimming. And that's our panel. So to begin tonight's uh, uh, moderator question session, uh, I'd like to start with a question that uh, has always interested me and, and that I've always wanted to ask uh, global leaders in this space, but finally we get an opportunity to do so. So every year, technological capability surpasses the imagination. How does this generation of processor technology differ from last year's state of the art, and what design changes made this performance boost possible? <laughs> Some of the things you did helps other areas as well. I'll just highlight some of the key five things and um, 
in our new architecture. We have a new GPU architecture that came out called Pascal, and there are some really cool features in it, um, and one of which is, is HPM2, high memory bandwidth. Um, the other one is we all, every year we always improve our architecture, and that it goes, that has in this year as well as it has in previous years. Um, we've increased it so you get more computational power, and then we have a huge group of software people as well as hardware people that focus on not only improving our not only improving our hardware but also focusing on ways a group of people who focus on ways to um, make sure that you can utilize all that power um, because we know there's two things there's the hardware and then there's the access to it so that you can use it for whatever you're trying to do my focus is deep learning but so my primary goal is to make sure that anybody who's using deep learning can benefit from all these new features and the new architecture, but also for other, but the goal is also to have people who are doing general HSC things to benefit from that. Yeah, I'm with New Inch, I believe that the uh, transition of chips is going to be away from the concentration on compute and more communication. Today, I'll talk about that in a bit. To do a 64-bit multiply accumulate is about 60 picojoules of energy to get the data out of DRAM into the registers to perform the operation back again is about 4,200 picojoules. So why worry about the compute? You're losing all your energy and moving the data. So there's going to be a little closer. Okay. Yes. So there's going to be a convergence of the network the computing and the memory, they have to work together. It has to be one piece. So. Well, so let me see. So the question was, what enabled the chip to run better and faster, right? Yes. So I guess, well, I'm from Intel, so I'm, I should talk about Moore's Law, right? So we all know that Moore's Law is the, pretty much a driving force for putting more and more transistors on the same silicon, on the same area. And that more transistor has been actually given us the performance edge so that not only just Intel, but almost all the silicon company out there is integrating and putting more and more features into their processors. Now, having said that, right, I'm sure you all hear most of slows down, but at the same time, we actually hit a number of the bottlenecks, right? For example, we have thermals power almost 10 years ago so that we cannot keep increasing frequency of the chip. And therefore, we actually have to go into more parallel design and having more and more um, of so-called cores inside a processor there. And these are, and then the next challenge will be, as we actually integrate more transistors with the same chip, you will actually start getting into a fault tolerance problem. Well, transistor will fail. I mean, either you've got a cosmic ray comes in and strike your processor, and things like that, it's going to cause some problem in the chip. So how do you deal with when you have billions of transistors and one of them die, can you still survive with that kind of problem? Now, the other question that Douglas was pointing out is communication is becoming a problem, right? I mean, the amount of energy cost to actually compute the flaw is actually much, much less than moving data around. Now, these are all definitely challenges. And of course, right, over the years, we've been putting caches into the design so that we bring the data closer and closer to the processor. And yet, you know, the complication is now you've got many levels of caches inside your processor and it complicates your programming model. So, you know, the conundrum is that we got definitely a lot of good things going forward. We got billions of transistors to pay with, but at the same time, there are definitely a lot of physical constraints as well as programming constraints. And, you know, we at Intel are certainly working very hard trying to solve that problem. So, I, I, uh, I think in addition to all these excellent technical answers, I think there's a cultural thing that has happened over the past. 10 years, it's really enabled a lot of what uh, we're seeing as a fantastic growth today in deep learning and machine learning. And, and that is that people have just been so pathologically afraid of throwing anything away from a data standpoint that we're sitting on top of this huge ocean of information. And so as we get to better processor capabilities, from my interest, better acceleration capabilities, and also importantly, that the ghost of the machine, uh, and, and also the, the ability to tie them together with extreme bandwidth within the system, we really end up at a great confluence today. So it's it's very exciting. I think that that has driven a lot of the advance and the evolution.
I'm afraid that none of the speakers were built by NVIDIA until I've given a new edge. So my apologies. Um, I would actually like to um, skip over and have everyone do the presentations because I think that if we do some presentations, you'll get a better sense of um, each uh, of the panelists' products and then you can see some of the newest lineup of their AI and deep learning technologies and I think that will um, better launch our discussion and questions. So I think we can actually start with uh, Allison. I have your slide up here. So when you have an opportunity, I think we're ready. Okay. So I'm going to talk about our deep learning platform. I'm just going to go over it. I, I was told that I'm only supposed to talk for 13 minutes, so I promise I'm going to be really fast. Um, but before I get started, um, I just want to introduce some of the other people here with me. I'm not the only person from NVIDIA here this evening. We have another person, Scott Ellis, in the back, and uh, Mark Skinner right over here. If you are local to this area, they are local too, and they can help answer any of your NVIDIA questions. Um, so reach, I know we've got some networking going on today, so if you have questions and you can't get to me, please reach out to them. They are fantastic, and I'm really thankful to have them here this evening. Okay, so deep learning. Um, I'm a solutions architect. I spend almost all of my time kind of interacting with people who are, who are users to some degree. Users are explorers in the multi-deep learning space and use GPUs for deep learning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our platform. <clears throat> but I'm going to stand over here because I've got some people. And Allison, if you can please speak up into the microphone. You know, maybe mine seems to project better. Perhaps we can swap. Okay. Let's try this one. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how we've come to where we are today, um, and I'll just talk about this from an NVIDIA perspective. Detect 
um, things in aerial images or to detect things from a vehicle, you could still use for a per you could use that same technique for a person who's maybe blind to help them see and prevent them from walking into a busy street or prevent them from walking into a person on the sidewalk. So there are a variety of ways to use machine to use deep learning and machine learning techniques as well to help you accomplish almost any task or help you be more effective at almost any task you wanna you wanna complete. And then this just kind of gives us another example here that I wanted to, I have a few more examples that I wanted to show you guys about things that people are doing. Um, I also kind of wanted to say, I talked, I mentioned Netflix, I showed a picture of like Pinterest, I talked about Amazon, um, but it's more than just the industry, right? It's more than just the products I touch every day. There's a lot of artificial intelligence research going on in other places. I mean, we're seeing all these initiatives from automotive. We're seeing incredible amounts of research coming out of our academic institutions as well. I feel like at every level, there's some type of deep learning activity going on, and it is really impressive. Um, I find what I can do with my iPhone to be incredible, but I also find what is coming out of these universities to be astonishing today. Um, and it's just everywhere. So even from the things that I touch every day to just the things that I'm reading about. Um, and I work for Media, we have GPUs, and you can get a GPU today in almost any platform. I use GPUs on AWS, um, I use it in, you can use it in Azure, and um, even IBM has a cloud platform that I've used as well. In 2015, we worked closely with IBM to sponsor the 2015 ImageNet co competition and competitors. So if you were competing in the ImageNet competition or interested, and you apply for resources through us. You worked with me directly and with um, some of the awesome people at IBM on that. Um, and then in addition to that, I would just say that like, if you're not in the cloud, um, there are a lot of other ways to get GPUs too. You can get them through um, your workstations. I have them on my laptop. We also have embedded devices. I brought from my show and tell. <clears throat> so if you want something low power, we've got that too. If you want to do something on the fly and tinker. Um, I think that a lot of you guys are really experienced in the deep learning space, but so I this this slide here may not really mean so much to you. You may already, this may be old news for you, but I thought we should have it here anyways, just because these are the deep learning frameworks and they're all GPU accelerated. If you are an expert in deep learning already, you're probably already familiar with all these and you use one or two of them actively. But for those of you who aren't, what I will tell you is it is super easy to get started. There are tons of tutorials, there's tons of documentation, and there are tons of ways to get started. So if you like Python, you can look at Theano, you can look at TensorFlow. Um, if you're a Lua person, no problem, you can use um, you can use Torch. If you're interested in almost anything, I think if you're an R person, MXNet has bindings in R as well. So there's something for almost every language out there if you want to get started with deep learning. And the documentation is incredible. Um, in addition to like documentation, I would say that the documentation is easier to read than any textbook I went through my first time in college. <laughs> so it's like that good. And then if you even have a hard time, there are Google user groups, there are forums, and there are these crazy amazing students out there who write really good blogs about how to do something in a super easy to understand thing. Um, so, this is just a slide that kind of recaps our products um, and talks about, and just kind of shows. Can you hear? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and just shows the different ways that you can access the GPU. Um, this is focused on our Tesla products, which would be things that go in a data center. We have a DGX, um, and this is a really cool system that we came out recently. This is a dual socket system, and it has eight of our new GPUs in it, new Pascal D GPUs. There are a lot of really cool things about Pascal um, that make it really incredible and great for deep learning and other applications. One is the high memory bandwidth. Another one is NVLink. NVLink is a mechanism, is a NVIDIA product that improves the communication between GPUs. So if you are a multi-GPU user, you will be really interested in this because you get way more bandwidth between way more communication bandwidth between your GPUs. And Mark over here has a sample of it, so if you're interested in putting your hands on it, 
he has got one so you can see it. But we also have other things too, if you are in for your server, we have P40s and we have P4s. P4s are really cool because they're really small and they only require about 75 watts, so you don't need any external power. Okay, and I would love to talk to anyone in more detail later about our products. And I'm, am I low on time? You have about two minutes left. <laughs> All right, two more minutes with me, guys. So, um, GPU learning or deep learning model. I do deep learning all the time. I talk about it. Um, I even experiment with it, and I read about it. I, I focus mostly on student blogs, though, and hands-on tutorials, because um, that's really where I get my, my hands dirty on the deep learning stuff. But um, this is kind of what it's. This is kind of like our circle, right? We've got training in the data center, um, training with your neural network, and then you can do deployment in your data center. But then you can also do. You can use the little clicker for uh, if you click it. There's a, a red laser right in the center. Ah, there. Okay. And then if you've got a device, so if you have a mobile device, or if you have a vehicle and you want to deploy something to that, you know, this is one way you can do it, right? You can do all your training, all your heavy lifting in the cloud. So for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with doing deep learning, there's a the training part is training part is very computationally intense and can take a long time. So for the most part, I do most of that in a with a server in a in our like small cluster. But then when I'm done, if I want, I can deploy it on a mobile device, such as the um, such as the device I had I had over there, or if you want to deploy it in a vehicle or something like that. And then you can update it too. So maybe you need to make some changes to your network. For those of you who've done deep learning, you probably know that. Getting a neural network that is well suited for your task is kind of an iterative process. And sometimes you can spend a really long time hashing out all those edge cases. 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. So I'll just conclude by saying um, I would love to talk to you more about our Pascal products, and so would Scott and Mark. And I'll also tell you if you guys are interested, if you like NVIDIA and maybe looking for a job, we are hiring. And I have some cards that I'd love to hand you if you're interested in a position at NVIDIA. I'm going to open up your slot. Slot.
So we've been out there in stealth mode. What I'm going to show you today has literally not been revealed outside of our own company and the government. So, but I love talking about it. So here we are. So next slide. To us, machine learning is all about scaling. How well can you scale up? And I'll tell you why in a second. Excellent. <clears throat> Let's look at the neurobiological computer. Everyone calls this wetware. Okay. Let's look at the size scale we've got here. I'm not going to get too far. From flatworms up to <laughs> Look at the scaling. It's the same neural based system in the mammalian nervous system, but you're going from a few hundred neurons to hundreds of billions. What's the scaling factor we achieve in processors today? Factor 10, the littlest arm, the biggest arm, or the littlest Intel biggest. We don't scale with our architectures today. Now, something else I want to point out. All the fantastic deep learning you're seeing today is recognizing pictures and things like that. It's amazing. We're as good as fruit fly. That's all the matter we're doing. Years and years and years. I've been in the neural network business for approximately uh, since 1986 with HNC. I was director of engineering there. So Dan set out to say, if we really want to go up to human scale and thinking machine, what is it going to take? So there's more than you can digest here, but it's big. It is really big. So you're looking at billions, trillions, quadrillions of connections. So you're really looking at an absolutely phenomenal performance. It's got to be packaged in a small space because speed of light is an issue on a thing like this. So let's look a little bit about what it takes with existing architectures to achieve that. Well, the first thing you're fighting is this thing called the redshift. Uh, logic has gone faster, better, more of it. <coughs> But getting the data to it is not improvement. So at the top, we're seeing latency for DRAM. On the bottom, we're seeing it for logic. That's called the ridge shift. That separation is a disaster. As I promised, to do 64-bit multiply at 64 picojoules to get the data out of DRAM to do the operation 4,200. You're blowing all your energies moving the data. So we decided to rethink it, not so much from the standpoint of silicon, but from the standpoint of the architecture of the silicon. Next slide. So where do we look for an example? Let's look at the mammalian nervous system. What do we see here? Literally an infinite number of connections. Wow, it's the connections, it's the communication, okay? Adjacency of the memory and the processing. And heterogeneity. How many threads are in there? There's over a hundred billion threads. How many threads do you operate today in most machines, particularly 17 machines? Not many. So heterogeneity, lots of threads, lots of communication. So we made up some rules for how we were going to change architecture and computing. One is scalable heterogeneous parallelism. Heterogeneous, keep that in mind. Every neuron in your body is doing a different job in a different way, computing in a different way. Proximity of memory and processing, obvious. Support for complex connections in the hardware, not in the software, in the hardware. Drive the architecture of communications and push the information through. Not one neuron in your brain is requesting information. Everything is pushed. Data flow, data flow. Last, you have to operate with noise and failures, as was pointed out earlier. So we took that recipe through to an ASA. Two rules of thumb and designing for the future here. One is you don't bring the desktop processor up into your cloud. 
bring the cloud down into your processor. Okay. Second one is most machine learning is really digital signal processing. Everyone that comes to you with an application, you've got to do a lot of DSP on it before you can really start thinking on it. So this is our processor. It's, it's a bit strange. The center of this is a router designed by a mad router designer that we have who designed for Broadcom and other companies. It can move about multiple uh, terabytes per second. It's one by two millimeters, multiple terabytes. It drove the IBM foundry crazy. At the top, the chip communicates through 10, or I'm sorry, through 16, 10 gigabit per second bidirectional high-speed serial links. It looks more like a router than anything else, but below that is the computation. What we have is 32 small secondary routers, each one attached to eight, I call them TDSPs for tiny DSPs. They're attached to the memory. We're running over uh, a terabyte per second bandwidth on the memory. There's 80 megabytes of memory on that chip, did you see that? This is our three-year-old design. We're coming up with something much better. So, so another unusual thing about this, uh, the clock tree in most chips today is the thing that is the biggest sink of power. There's no clock tree here. Everything is asynchronous. This is pure data flow. Everything is pushes to the system. So, everything is based on flip communications. From the TDSP, through the routers, all the way up, these chips just glue together. You put more and more and more and more together, and we just keep putting more. We put 500,000 chips, 128 million cores. Now, the interesting thing about it is when you send data from one TDSP to another one, an entire data center, much larger than we just saw at Scale Matrix, uh, you're talking about less than 200 nanoseconds. That's register to register. Many people like Finiband quote numbers, put it to the bottom of the cache pool. Then it takes a long time to alert up to processing. So we do everything in click communication and nothing else. We never switch modalities of communication. In addition, we have a control plan. We don't trust data flow for, for synchronization. We really have a control plan that can regulate everything that occurs internally down to the nanosecond, literally to the nanosecond. That avoids contention in the fabric. Next slide. Next slide. So the TSP itself is an interesting little guy. This is called an epic architecture, explicitly parallel instruction processor. Each instruction dispatches to uh, NPU and FPU, something like that, to perform the operation. It then advances to the next instruction, the next, and it keeps farming out what it wants to do. At the end, you can do, uh, wait for logical and, and collect it all together and proceed. You can dispatch a packet to anywhere else and one box at them. So the upshot on it is, we take our chips, you glue them together any way you want, you wire them together in a data center, and then you say, go. And within a millisecond, the entire thing, the topology of it, is memorized and shot back to the host for downloading and synthesis in the first millisecond. So it doesn't matter how you wire them together, they come up and are cognizant of what you've got. Go ahead. So the ASICs that I passed on somewhere here, do it. Looks like this. Now the interesting thing is the TSPs are sitting in little blocks of ED RAM, which is a brilliant IBM invention, very low power, very high speed memory. They're actually the same size as a human neuron. Just kind of interesting. They're very tiny. 256 of them. Um, the chip itself is quite large, but it's mostly filled with RAM, and that overcomes more than the the problems we have today in silicon, which is it tends to overheat in small areas. So we fill it with RAM that doesn't generate as so much heat. So what I'm kind of getting at in the architecture here is this tension to detail. You can come up with a brilliant architecture, but 
little tiny details, every picosecond that you're moving in here is a delay that slows the whole thing down. So you have to watch everything in the design. Next slide. So performance. Um, when we crank this up, uh, for example, for the power and everything else we're getting, and this is the last generation, we're getting three times better performance on a thing like cave means clustering than any of the competitors. So, <laughs> I won't name them. Okay, next slide. So, in conclusion, basically, we call it a fabric. We call it lambda fabric because it's a lambda calculus type machine. It scales from wristwatch size to multi data center size, same software, same modality of communication. So we think we've reached the scalability and our next generation should push the limits a bit more. So one last slide. So it's basically uh, a router on steroids, it is a cloud on a chip. And that's the way it operates. So you don't think anymore, don't think chip when you're thinking, think the computing fabric. I'll look. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is going to be by Victor Lee from Intel. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. And I'm so glad to see so many of you here actually share the same belief that AI is going to change the, this one? Okay. Change the next uh, how we actually do computing. So I know many of you have great ideas how to use AI to actually change our life. So I'm not going to talk about that. But instead, I'm actually here going to talk about you know, what Intel is going to offer to actually help you realize this kind of uh, ideas. Wow, so I guess uh, PowerPoint didn't really do a great job. <laughs> anyway, um, let me try to tell you what the slide is supposed to do. Well, we need some AI here. Um, so, to start with, you know, Intel has this vision of saying, if it's smart, if it's connected, it is best with Intel. And in this kind of vision, we actually put AIs right in the center of it. Because we believe that with artificial intelligence, it's actually going to change how people actually do compute. It's no longer just your laptop or your big supercomputer hiding in the cloud. It is actually all computing device that's actually sitting in your pocket or you actually wear them on your body itself. And here, Intel is really, well, we are really invested and we are really focusing on how do we deliver the best product, both hardware and software tools as well as training to actually help, you know, customers like you to actually realize your ideas of how to apply AI to change our life. So this is a slide of hidden layers. The text that is in hidden layers behind it. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, so next time I need to really test the, the presentation before presenting. So um, Intel actually uniquely offered a stack that actually go all the way from just a portfolio of lots of different kinds of processor that goes into from um, Processor that in the supercomputer to process in your laptop to process in your phone to process in your watch and potentially things that you can wear on your body to a lot of the software stack actually on top of it. I mean, the impression is that Intel is a silicon company, but the, the fact is that we actually more going towards a solution company and we believe that hardware and software co coexist together is the only way that we can actually deliver the value to our customer. So, the next. So let me start with, you know, obviously talking about our processor. We actually provide a gamut of processors. From the, from the left, we have our Xeon processor, which actually exists in almost every server in the world. And in, in fact, it is actually the most commonly used platform for doing machine learning today. I mean, because just imagine, there's just so many of them out there. To the next one, which is our Xeon 5 processor, which actually is our high performance computing chip that goes into many of the world's supercomputers. It is actually designed with the fact that 
we want to have high compute density together with low cost and low energy efficiency. Oh, I'm sorry. Low energy cost and high energy efficiency. So in the sense that that actually allow us to power up a very large supercomputer with a reasonable amount of power. To the left, to the right here, we actually have two new members of our family here. On the top is our Nirana chip, which we call them um, Liquest as our codename. It is actually um, a deep learning accelerator designed from, from ground up, specifically to accelerate um, deep learning, especially in training phases, to actually allow it to close to new real-time training capability. And then the bottom of the right side, it's our program, few programmable processor, you know, our FPGAs, in a sense that for customer who actually have your own custom ASIC or custom IP block that you want to put into your product to make a differentiation, before you actually build an ASIC of it, you can potentially use the FPGA, and if the, if the costs work out, you can actually potentially shift the FPGA together with your product and then have your own um, custom IP sitting in there. So, I mean, because of the time constraint, I'm not going to go into each of the processor and talk about, you know, what's the features of it, but I think for the sake of interest here, we will talk about our two newest members of it. The first one is LiquQuest. Um, it is in the Rana chip, as I mentioned earlier, it is actually designed from ground up specifically for deep learning capability. And as we know, many of our processors, as you look at the whole spectrum there, from a general purpose processor where you need to do well in many, many different applications to a very, very specific ASIC. In the ASIC size, the, the main focus there is performance, uh, very low power, so that you have extremely high efficiency. And the LakeQuest family is exactly one of those processors. In a sense that you pack a lot of, um, well, so, what, so you ask me, what is the most important computation going into deep learning training? It is the multiply app. So the, so the Lake Quest processor will pack a lot of them inside this ASIC there. In fact, it's going to offer the most amount of compute density that you know, all the processor has to offer. And I cannot disclose to you exactly how much it is, but it's going to be an amazing amount. In fact, it's probably going to be orders of magnitude bigger than any of the chips that we know today. Now, the other thing is, you no, know, just having compute is not sufficient. You know, being a computer scientist myself, I've designed many chips. I know if I just put the holding power and multiply add into my chip, this is not going to be enough. We need to be able to feed this compute, otherwise your chip is not going to be any useful. So for this particular chip, um, we actually again also put in a new generation of very high performance memory on die. Um, in fact, it's going to have 32 gigabytes of those on die memory. Together it will offer about a terabyte of bandwidth going from this memory to the processor. Now that's a single chip, right? As Dr. has talked about, we cannot just do the training in a single chip. In fact, to do anything in real time, we need many of them. So how do you interconnect them all together? So this particular chip, at least the first generation of it, it's going to have 12 of the bidirectional interconnect that allows it to be connected to neighbors within the same chassis, or potentially to other similar ASICs on another chassis itself. Having 12 of these bidirectional high bandwidth um, interconnect it really allows it to have a very very fast communication. But of course, right from an energy perspective, it's still going to cost. But, but you know, this is the best way we know how to build a system today. So can we go to the next one? Okay. So enough about the LiquQuest family. The so next one about is our um, FPGA. Um, currently, we offer this Aries 10 um, FPGA which is sort of our top of the line FPGA field programmable processor. As I mentioned earlier, the key thing about field programmable processor is that if you have some special custom IP that you don't want to share with other people, but yet you want to ship it and differentiate your product, this is the best way to put it in, in your product itself. Because this is programmable, so as you change it, you can have an upgrade path going forward and say, now I have an upgrade to change to my IP, but yet the whole platform doesn't have to change. Now, it is very energy efficient. In fact, um, when we actually look at you know, putting some of the deep learning, especially image classification to run on this particular chip, compared to all the other processors on the market, it actually gives us the highest performance per watt um, metrics in there. So can you go to the next slide, please? 
So here, just give you some basic ideas about this chip's performance, right? So in fact, we're going to have two versions of the chip. The discrete version, where you actually have the processor, you can sit onto a PGA card, uh, I'm sorry, a PCIe card, um, that you can directly program, in fact, for something like an AlexNet, for doing image inference. You can get up to, using single, using single precision, um, oops, sorry. Um, using single precision data type, you can actually get up to close to about 600 images per second for only about 30 watts. So you can actually see it's actually very, very low power for very high performance. But if you're willing to drop it down to a half precision FP16 type of capability, in fact, the performance is going to double close to about a greater than a thousand images per second for only 9 watts more. It's only at about 40 watts of capability. So together, it will give you the 25 image per second per watt type of capability. Now, we also have a product that actually takes the FPGA and combines it with the Xeon processor on the MCM package that you can actually drop into your Xeon <coughs> socket and then with the same socket, not only have the Xeon processor but also have the FPGA processor there to, for you to do your custom IP. In this particular case, because it's integrated, we have some more power constraints, so the chip runs a little bit slower, but they still get a pretty reasonable close to about 600 images per second at half precision. Right, right. So can you go next slide? So a new product in this family here is what we call Canyon Whistler. Um, it's going to be coming later this year. What it is, is it's actually the AWS 10 FPGA sitting on a PCIe card. But at the same time, it will actually be shifted with um, Intel's IP for image recognition. So this particular product there, it's, if you'd be interested in doing, let's say, um, video surveillance, security, um, recognition, and well, face recognition, and so on, this will be a product that you can directly buy and plug into your system, and it will automatically already do this kind of processing for you. It will come with the card, it will come with the custom IP, as well as some software for you to interface with your software itself. Next slide. So, talking about time frame, right? So these are the things that we are going to offer for 2017. From the Crest family, it's actually coming out later this year, together with the Canon Vista, which is again a deep learning appliance in some senses. Everything it's an is everything in the card that you can buy and plug into your system. To, on the Xeon 5 line, we're actually going to have a new Xeon 5 processor called named Nightsmield. It's specifically upgraded for deep learning so that it will actually perform probably, I would say, you know, more like four times faster compared to our current Xeon 5 processor, specifically for deep learning. And then again, for, for our Xeon line, we're going to have our next generation processor, the Kony Skylake coming out, I think more like in the middle of the year. And then again, you will have a Skylake processor plus the FPGA version. So therefore, you do have a choice of many of the Intel chip for possibly for to helping you doing machine learning and AI type of applications. So, next slide. So, that's just only the bottom layer here, right? This is the type of processor that we are offering. And on top of it, you can see there's a whole stack of software that actually need to so that we can actually build useful AI application. So on top of the hardware, we have a lot of layer. We have a lot of what we call performance library, starting from our Intel MKL, which is stand for Math Kernel Library. It, it, it put a lot of the scientific computing kernel, and we have a version of MKL that called MKL DNN that is specifically have the routines in there that are targeting for deep learning, deep neural network type of operation. And then on the other hand, we also have something called Intel DAO, which is the Intel Data Acceleration Library. So it is for data analytic operation for a lot of the classic um, machine learning type algorithms such as KE, ALS, and so on. So those are already optimized and sitting in the DAO library. And on top of it, of course, we will enable all the common framework, the ones that you, you know and love, for example, Cafe, Tiano, TensorFlow, MXNets, and so on. And then, of course, we will have to add in our latest uh, um, things from our uh, Nirvana folks. We have, we're going to have the Neon system also be a part of that. Now, on top of these framework, we also provided what we call the productivity layer. So we have something called Intel Deep Learning SDK, which essentially is a GUI that actually helps people to um, explore um, 
deep kind of deep learning topology, and then the tab is actually our uh, trusted analytic platform. So I think well, I'm out of time, so let me just put one more foil. So the only other thing is, uh, we're going to have this thing called Nirvana Graph Compiler coming out, which is also is how we see uh, interconnect, taking all the different kinds of framework and be able to map them down very efficiently into our hardware. So I guess I'm out of time, so I can't really elaborate more, but find me afterwards and I'm very happy to tell you more about this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, right now we're going to finish the last um, uh, presentation and then we're going to do moderator questions. We're going to continue with them. We have about five or six questions and based on time, we plan to give about 30 minutes of question and answer from the audience. So I think that's going to be a very interesting part of the presentation. Okay, and now to introduce uh, Scott Sutter from IBM. So thank you, Tristan, and thank you, Scale Matrix, for hosting us tonight. This has been a great event, and I really enjoyed hearing from my uh, fellow panelists today. It's been very, very enlightening. Um, I am from the part of the IBM cognitive business that is not Watson. Right? So IBM spent the last five years trying to drill in everybody's head that Watson is machine learning, and machine learning is Watson. Um, not that. Uh, but what I am doing is uh, I am running a piece of our business today that is focused on one of what I think is the most interesting segments of machine learning today, the deep learning, the deep learning business. Uh, next slide, please. So look, everything's changing, right? Um, if you haven't seen some version of this slide, consider yourself lucky. Uh, every single presentation I've been in, and I promised every single presentation I've given will have a slide in it. But I think it really talks to what is, is a pretty interesting technology phenomenon today. We are seeing uh, this expansion of this, this vague, ill-defined term of, of AI into something that's been very, very functionally uh, oriented. And we've, we've seen the growth of machine learning as a set of technologies really uh, take advantage of what I talked about just briefly earlier about this huge stockpile of data that's out there. That's really been the enabling technology today. And uh, we, we consider ourselves very fortunate uh, that we are at a point where the capability of acceleration and the capability of compute power are allowing us to actually do something with that data today. So at the, t at the same time that machine learning has been growing and evolving, we've seen a new technology, which is really this evolution of machine learning, deep learning, uh, emerge. And with it comes the capability of applying neural technologies and neural software capabilities against traditional machine learning problems. Why is this interesting? The level of precision that we're... I have to, this is the spot right here. All right, um, I think that the level of precision that we can get at algorithmically through the use of these neural networks is, is uh, exponentially greater than where we've been previously with machine learning. And so we're seeing this very, very rapid adoption of deep learning as a methodology. I think right now, and I, I, I actually I trust these numbers, we've seen deep learning growing at about 65% year on year in terms of adoption. So it's a fascinating place to be. Next slide. So what's standing in our way right now? Um, we are seeing a, a rapidly evolving and greatly growing ecosystem, and this has impacts on stability. I think what's, what's fantastic is so much of this is taking place out in the world of open source, and that has certainly been a business that my personal business has been deeply engaged with. Uh, there are challenges with that, trying to tie together a hundred different open source packages to try and build a TensorFlow environment today is nothing short of maddening. Um, the, the next major issue that we are running into today, and the skills are scarce. Having people with knowledge of data science, having people who can think about data as a building block for um, addressing an enterprise problem, addressing a, 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 a research problem, those skills are, 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 are few and far between. And so it's wonderful to see this room here of folks that are interested in this and are, and are working in this field. Um, we're hiring, <laughs> we're dying to, to find this sort of skill because our customers are dying to find these skills. We've had a lot of interest, we've had a lot of excitement out in the industry, but people are stalling. 
because they can't get the hands on to actually address the problem. Um, and then there are really some structural barriers, I think, that, that we struggle with today. Um, the software tools are complex, um, doesn't scale well. Much of the software written around deep learning uh, tool sets, written in a uh, manner and time where it's logically very expensive to pull data from memory into processing. Um, we're trying to address that as well. Uh, and then also, uh, as we look at the broader adoption, that second or third wave of adoption of these technologies, lack of support, lack of infrastructure skill around this is really standing in our way. So IBM's approach to this and where we've stepped into the deep learning world is something called Power AI. Um, this is free. You can go download this today. You can go download it tonight. Power AI is a package of pre-compiled open source deep learning frameworks um, sitting on top of pre-compiled open source deep, uh, libraries that accelerate the capabilities of deep learning. It's simple to install. When we embarked on this journey last year, it took our team about two months to build a really good, scaling, working environment. We have simplified this installation, we've simplified this deployment into something that you can have up and running in 45 minutes, three commands. We hope that that removes one of those barriers to adoption. It shouldn't be that hard. My boss, Sumit Gupta, likes to call what we're doing here being the Red Hat of Deep Learning. Red Hat likes that we're calling it the Red Hat of Deep Learning. They enjoy the hat type. The whole infrastructure here is built upon IBM's power processors and NVIDIA Pascal P100 Tesla accelerators. Next slide, please. So our goal was really to address a heat map what we thought the most popular deep learning frameworks out there were. We're looking at frameworks that are aimed at image recognition, such as CAFE, scientific analysis, such as Theano, um, Torch, and then the fastest growing, most popular framework out there today, TensorFlow, uh, version 0.12 is in Power AI today, version 1.0 is in Power AI next week. We built this all, um, like I mentioned, in a single pre-compiled uh, delivery. We've put the source up there. If you want to go to the project pages, you can pull this down, see what we've done. Um, and we would invite you to take a look at it. We think we're doing some pretty interesting work around scaling, particularly as it relates to memory handling and utilization. It's all designed to take advantage of IBM's accelerated servers and infrastructure, uh, and it's cloud ready. You can run it on those power servers that are sitting right next door in the scale matrix data center. Next slide, please. So, why is this work? We've done something interesting, and this is uh, a statement about a culmination of work that we have done along with NVIDIA and Mellanox over the course of the last three years. I'll admit we were, were lucky. About three years ago, we embarked together on a project to build a accelerated computing node that sort of broke the barriers to bandwidth. We believe, as NVIDIA do, that uh, connectivity is key. We believe that applying that bandwidth, that peer-to-peer -peer bandwidth between the GPUs themselves and the GPU and CPU are critical. In data-hungry applications, such as deep learning training applications, if you can't get the data there, you're hitting the wall. You're failing the scale. So in our architecture, we've really focused on that bandwidth between GPUs and between GPU and CPU. This is a unique architecture. It's only available through IBM and our open power partners, such as Penguin Computing, Supermicro, uh, and others. Um, what you'll see there is a very balanced system, and what you'll see there is a very logically flat system. And this is where I think there's an opportunity for innovation. It has been expensive to get data in and out of memory. What we're trying to do here with this architecture is flatten that capability. We have customers right now that are blowing through the capability of their simulations. They cannot run fast enough. They cannot run clearly enough on the memory available on GPU. By taking advantage of this flatter architecture using something called page migration engine from NVIDIA, 
you're able to actually coherently and directly map system numbering across the entire system. We think there's a tremendous amount of, of opportunity for innovation here, particularly as we look at larger models, larger data elements that sit within models. And I'd invite you to talk with me about this afterwards. I have some ideas. Next slide, please. So, it's out there. Um, this really, IBM has the Watson product, which is fantastic, but that's a buy. You, 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 you purchase the machine learning capability by the API. This is really aimed at folks who want to build. And in particular, we're really focused right now on folks who want to innovate around this capability. We're looking for partners, we're looking for folks that are hitting a performance wall and are interested in exploring a new way to address uh, deep learning architectures. And that's it for me. I'll be here. All right, excellent. So now we're going to continue with the um, moderator questions. I'd like to get some lights on if somebody can take care of them over there. It's the second one from the last. Excellent. So, you raised an interesting point uh, about IBM's offerings, and I wanted to start um, actually at, by asking a question about cloud versus local processing. I think this is something very interesting for our audience members. Uh, what are the pros and cons, and how will this balance shift in the future, local versus uh, cloud processing? Well, I think uh, the balance has shifted, <laughs> right? I mean, we are in the era of the cloud. Um, that said, it's very expensive to move data. It costs you a peak of cents a bit to move data across a wire. Um, real money out of your pocket to buy bandwidth. Some of these data sets that we are working with and our clients are working with today, um, there are security considerations. There could be a lot of precious information in there. Uh, and then some of the training sets are just pretty damn big. I went and visited a client. I came back with a bunch of disk drives in my bag because the cost of actually moving it over the wire was going to be greater than the benefit of running an R plus bar. So um, I, I think you kind of pick and choose. I, IBM will always talk about a hybrid approach. Uh, we want to sell servers, right? No, no secret. We would like to sell servers. But um, we think that there's a lot of benefit, especially if you're looking at uh, places where your data is adjacent to cloud processing capability. We think there's a huge benefit there. And, um, we would certainly look uh, to our partners like Scale Matrix as a way to help our clients grow and, and find the amount of accelerated computing capability that they need. Hello? Okay. Well, so I guess there's a business answer, there's an academic answer. I'm not sure which one I should give, but I mean, from, from the business point of view, certainly like Scott Skin, right? Um, cloud, it's definitely exploded, right? In a way that a lot of things is being processed on the cloud, but certainly they are constrained and concerned, right? Like security, how do you move from a large amount of data over there? I think from an academic point of view, it's that in order for compute to be everywhere, um, the local competition has to come up. I mean, especially the edge computing. Because you just cannot process, I mean, upload all the data. I mean, as Douglas is going to say that, you know, that's going to cost you an army like, just to move your data up there. So there, there will be going to be a lot of local processing happening there. So I would say, from an academic point of view, it's actually shifting towards more balancing, that you will going to have more and more local computation, but yet you will still rely on the cloud to do more things for, you know, how you look at the overall scope of things. No, I can concur completely. Our uh, customer base, some of them won't tell us where they put things, but uh, to a great extent, um, private servers in a small cloud for some of the customers and uh, up in places like Amazon. So, so I'll, I'll just kind of echo what everybody else said. Um, and I'll just say from personal experience, it, Everything they're saying is true, and when I talk to someone directly, it's a balance, um, and it just depends. Um, I, if you have a lot of data, 
and you can utilize hardware in the cloud. I generally like to do it, but if you are, but when I'm doing prototyping or when I'm talking to someone about prototyping, it's usually with a small subset of data and they'll do it locally. Um, some of the challenges that I, at least from people that I talk to, um, some of the challenges they have is sometimes people are intimidated by the cloud or maybe they're on a cluster and they don't feel comfortable with the scheduler. So that's when I say, okay, let's get you started rolling and going locally. And then while you're doing that in parallel, let's get everything you need up into your data center or the cloud so that once you're ready for that, everything's there and you're ready to go. And we can support you as you transition. Um, there's that. And then, so that's doing like a workstation locally and then in the cloud or maybe the data center that you have locally. And then there's something like this where this is kind of like a strategic plan or this is part of your workflow because this is a low power device or other people will have low power devices as well where you're always going to have some amount of processing on the fly here. Um, but this is just another piece of the puzzle. I think it just happens everywhere, right? You're going to have some amount of processing happening at every level. So uh, thank you for the answers. Uh, and I actually would like to direct uh, another question uh, towards you, Allison, because I've been following NVIDIA's uh, progress through video gaming for a very long time. And uh, just wanted to ask, uh, what are some of the other industry applications uh, which this technology will achieve in the next two to three years? Uh, name some specific examples of companies and sectors which are experiencing paradigm shifts and disruption as a result of your uh, processing hardware. Oh my. Okay, so this is a really big question. Um, I guess things that I've seen recently, um, I think in the autonomous driving is probably where I'm seeing a lot. Um, and even in the medical industry, I'm seeing a lot too. Um, autonomous driving, gosh, like so many car companies now have these huge initiatives. I mean, Tesla has been around, but I think Toyota has an initiative. Um, there are other car, car companies out there that have this like deep learning machine learning initiative. And, um, and Audi seem to have something there was a collaboration with us in. So I think you're going to see that pretty soon. Um, in the medical industry, I think we see, we're seeing a lot of activity just because there's an abundant amount of data. We talked earlier about people just kind of hoarding all this data and sitting on it and that opportunity. And I think the medical industry is another place where you're going to see that. Maybe what kind of the impression, I'm not in the medical industry, so I just kind of hear things from people, but the impression that I have is that there's a lot of sensitivity around data, around medical data, because it's very personal, and so that might have been something that was kind of holding things back for a little while, but I think that we're getting really good about understanding how to use this data effectively and not, not negatively impact an individual person, use it for deep learning, use it with our products to change things, to solve problems, to help people, specifically in the medical industry, one thing is like identifying cancer more effectively at early stages, or identifying mutations that will lead to cancer um, more effectively really early on to help save lives, things like that. And would anyone else on the panel like to chime in on this particular question? So we have a, a customer who is actually, um, uh, they are very heavily using computer vision and machine vision, and they're using it in a very non-traditional sense. Um, they are a utility company. They have a huge infrastructure. Early on, they were in, uh, an investor in drones to try and fly drones across all the power lines in their service area, and they rapidly ran into a problem that, well, now, now we've got hundreds of thousands of hours of drone video and nothing to do with it. Um, so, we uh, luckily they are also pack rats. They're data pack rats, like uh, like many folks. And they have this huge infrastructure of data covering what are uh, broken, breaking, degrading components of their infra of their uh, utility infrastructure. They're able to train on this very quickly, so now they can view the drone imagery in real time. They can run inference out at the camera and say, "Go up hole number twenty, because that's where things are happening right." Um, this has a direct human impact. Utility working is one of the most dangerous jobs out there. 20 people per 100,000 per year die. Um, so they're re 
really reducing the impact on their workforce. They're adding a lot of efficiency to their capability. They know what they need when they climb up that pole. Um, and we're, we're just tremendously excited to be a part of that and, uh, and help them get there. Sure, so um, would you like to answer this question? Well, I would just want to add a couple more from the HPC perspective. Um, so a lot of the national labs that these days are actually looking at, well, so you know, one of the reasons we build supercomputer is so that we can actually do more simulation, right? So you, you increase the resolution, increase the time step so you can actually simulate a bigger system and so on. But then they're starting to realize that, you know, there is a limitation to how big a system that you can, you can actually build, right? I mean, building it is one thing, but paying for the electricity bill is another thing. Um, so they actually are looking into using machine learning to augment the, the first principle of simulation science. And then how, they, how the two systems actually combines together, it's going to open up a new way of how we look at science together. So this is definitely one trend that I'm seeing a lot happening in the HPC side. And then on another front, actually all more on the neuroscience side. In fact, um, Intel has been um, partnering with Princeton University. You actually have a new institute of Princeton that actually look at um, using fMRI to actually image the human brain and try to see how people think, you know, using that technology and saying, when, when this person look at, let's say, an apple versus an orange, which part of their brain actually lights up? And this actually generates a huge amount of data. And with the recent um, advances in computing, in fact, both in terms of new hardware, higher capability, higher compute capability, as well as changing the, in the software algorithm and so on. In fact, we actually speed this up. Previously, people think that at the current resolution, which is about one micron um, resolution of the brain, will take 44 years for you to actually analyze the data on a computer. We actually speed it up almost to real time. In fact, we speed up about, about 10,000 X. And now we can actually do the same level of imaging and same kind of analysis in less than two minutes. And again, the, the goal is for our next generation processor, we're hoping to actually do it real time so that they can actually look at your brain and try to figure out what you're thinking. That could be dangerous. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, one of our customers, I won't name, they have 57,000 people in IT. 57,000 employees in IT. They're fined multiple billions of dollars every year from theft. It's finance, of course. Finance insurance, it's absolutely huge. It is it, intense manpower, uh, security, theft, malware, the whole gamut. They need robo adjusters. They actually want to replace humans with computers. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and Oh, would you, would you like to chime in? So, um, we just spoke about all this power, uh, hardware and, and algorithmic. What kind of, what are the major barriers do you see to the adoption of deep learning in broader enterprise from your perspective? We can start with uh, NVIDIA. Uh, okay, so, I'm give you a response, this response is based on the people that I'm talking to. Um, some of the challenges that, that, that I've seen. Some of the challenges that, I, that I've seen. Um, one which was mentioned earlier was, was just expertise. Uh, I, I, I talked to a lot of people who are kind of just getting started. They see all this excitement about deep learning and they want to hire people and they can't find them. <laughs> Is this better? <laughs> okay, that seems to be better. Um, so expertise, it's hard. Um, and and I think it, it takes a long time. Deep learning, it's kind of deep stuff. If you take break it down on a really simple level, it's just a convolution. I mean, if we just want to talk about the image CNN part, it's a convolution. If you know your Fourier theorem, sure, it's no big deal. But you start combining all these things together, and then you start reading all these papers, and you're like, it's kind of an empirical process. These guys have got good networks. Is this like a shot in the dark or what? Um, so expertise, um, finding people with that expertise, and um, and then just doing whatever's going to make sense for solving a problem. 
I think that those are a lot of the, the things that I, that I come across during initial engagements. Um, there are challenges later with um, data locality, um, how to get it there, um, how to utilize your hardware, all of your hardware. Like, make sure that everything in your, in your system, each of the systems, each system you have is working as hard as it possibly can. Getting as much performance out of your CPU and GPU entire system architecture as possible. Um, that, that comes up later too. Um, one of the issues we've seen in adoption is inflated expectations. Um, <laughs> we all have those. Yeah. The other one are very, very simple principles like stationarity of the data. You know, it's what's that? It's an absolute key to you know, making anything work. Um, a lot of this has to be automated. Knowledge uh, capture and moving along is absolutely critical to all of this. So we're trying to push this down to a technical level. So our product announcement will go out there probably later this year, but we're trying to move deep learning to a very low level where kids will start it, absorb it, and grow up with it. Well, I think I agree with Allison in that, you know, deep learning is actually far from, you know, when you you hear everybody say, oh, AlexNet is so great, and you know, all the different CNN and so on. When you're actually going to try it, you realize it doesn't really tell you what you want to hear. And so, you know, I actually think education, you know, how do we actually teach people, make people aware of, you know, what is this technology can actually give you, and how can you actually use it? It's actually there. So, you know, if, it, if I actually up level it into, you know, what exactly is the problem? I think it's really productivity. You know, how can we actually make the program? I'm sure all of you sitting here have some idea that you think, oh, if I can have that, that will be great. Now, how do you take that idea, going from an idea to become a real product? You know, how can you minimize that effort? How can you actually lower the barrier? I think that is actually going to be the, the, the sort of the barrier to adoption. I know a lot of company, including Intel, is actually working, trying to lower the barrier. I mean, there are so many frameworks out there, right? I mean, every day there's only a new framework that said, okay, well, if you use this framework, it's going to be easy. But again, right, so how do you go, you know, choose your tools so that you can actually do the job for you? You know, I think, again, I would just say, you know, we need to actually work a lot with the academics, with the university, so that we can actually train people and let them understand how we use it. Um, I, 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 it's fun when we all agree. <laughs> um, education is key, and we're, we're actually really excited as we see a lot of universities beginning to invest more in data science as a, as a domain. Um, I think that that uh, is going to help us usher the next wave of this technology along. Um, I think that there's also some, there's a fundamental opportunity for creativity. There's, there's a just an immense amount of software between training something on a deep learning training system and having an inference model and actually integrating that into something that's helpful and useful. And so that's where I think the, the opportunity for thought leadership is today, uh, to use last year's term, thought leadership. Um, and, and so I, th I think that that's a place where the creativity of, of the folks in this room will open up uh, a, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, a tremendous amount of innovation. Thank you. So I have one final question. Then we're going to allow Chris to tell you a little bit about Scale Matrix. And then we're going to get to the question and answer session from the audience. So get your questions ready. So the final question, and uh, I've heard a lot tonight about uh, various companies hiring, so I wanted to put it out there. I imagine that Many of our members would be interested in applying for positions at your companies. Please tell us one awesome thing about your company that almost no one outside of the organization knows about. Well, IBM has about as many people in it as Luxembourg. So, <laughs> chances are you know somebody. Uh, it's it's a it's a fascinating company. I've I've been in weird corners of it my entire career, which um, in two days is twenty years, which I never thought I would say. Um, 
but it, it gives you an opportunity to work globally on some of the most fascinating uh, projects in the world. So um, I would invite you to look at where IBM is applying some of our research and some of the capabilities. And if, if you are a global citizen, um, this is a very good place to be. Okay, wow, a challenge up here. Um, one cool thing about working at Intel, I would say you get to sometimes look at what these chips that you make and be amazed how many, uh, how many transistors in there. We're always looking for the best and the brightest. And then in fact, I mean, I actually have been at Intel for 20 years. And for this last 20 years, I actually enjoy my journey every single day in the sense that I actually move around a lot inside Intel. It's a big company. It gives you lots of different opportunity. Um, I go from designing a chip to actually doing some research and then come back and design the chip to actually go and write software and then to go and talk to customer and come back and actually look at hmm, what are some of the challenges that we have to face and then what are the things that we need to go change. I think in a big company like Intel, potential IBM and many other top companies, there are lots and lots of opportunity. Again, if, you, if you're interested, if you have ideas, you, know, you will have the opportunity to explore and try something new. I think it's really awesome thing with us. We have three hummus and pita chips 24 hours a day. I think lately the most uh, well, our company is much smaller than this audience, so it, it's up close and personal. Everything you do, but I think one of the awesome things. Everyone from New Hampshire. Oh, not that. Okay, it's half the company. Okay. Um, <laughs> One of the awesome things, actually, is we're, we're 100 feet from the university, and we're bringing over lots of interns, so we have fresh, young ideas constantly flowing through. We really love that topic. So. Um, so I'll say, can I say two things? Of course. Okay, so the first one is, we have an open dog policy. Are you bring your dog to work? I take my dog to work every time I go to work, and I love it. It is amazing. Um, the second thing is that it's like really weird, it's going to be really salesy, but everybody's super duper dedicated um, in a really good way, like in a way that I never thought was possible. I worked in a national lab before where everything was very like regimented and structured and you had your funding cycle and proposals and blah, blah, blah. And like NVIDIA doesn't have that. We kind of, I, I've never worked at a startup. So some people say it runs like a startup, but I can't really verify it. But people are like really dedicated. I can send an email out at 11.30 at night, and somebody will respond. And they kind of smile while doing it. I know, and it's not, it's weird. It's not like we don't like work or live to work. We're still working to live, yet we're still getting a lot of stuff done. So I would say that's kind of like the second cool thing. Excellent, thank you so much. And. Uh, when you guys have a chance, we put a binder over there of some of our members' resumes. Uh, one of the goals of the Machine Learning Society is to help our members um, to transition into, into careers. Whether they're 20 year veterans or they're just getting into it, we know that many of the uh, audience members here tonight and the panelists, of course, have corporations that are looking for talent. Whether it's a startup or a large Fortune 500 company, our members uh, have excellent resumes, and I encourage you to take a look and see if uh, they fit your profile for what you're looking for. So, I want to thank the panel. Uh, I appreciate your coming tonight, and you're still going to answer some questions, but first I'm going to introduce uh, Chris for a moment to tell you a little bit about Scale Matrix and this uh, genomic facility behind me. Appreciate you all coming tonight. Hope you enjoyed the tour of the data center. Uh, what a great uh, panel that we've got here today. And it's really exciting to have all of you guys here as well. Um, Scale Matrix is a six year old business, but we've been operating in this space for <coughs> almost 20 years. And the data center that you saw today during your tour was built because we had a vision uh, a vision that we would be pushing compute and deep learning and artificial intelligence and things like that to a degree that traditional data centers may not be able to support. So five years ago, my partner and I got together and we developed the platform that you saw today. Um, it's called Dynamic Density Control. And I can tell you, uh, we were early to the party. 
when you launch a 52 kW cap in 2011, um, people ask you what you're doing uh, because you know file services and web servers and things like that don't put out a whole lot. Uh, and so uh, it was a little bit of a labor of love. It was a belief in what we believed was the future. Uh, but I can tell you this uh, with absolute clarity that as 2016 rolled around and as our 15th year platinum partnership with Intel and our new relationship with NVIDIA and our friends at IBM and the folks at Intel and everybody putting out new servers today that are more powerful, more powerful, help you do more you know, in a smaller footprint. Um, that now our data center is now becoming extremely relevant for enterprise customers when they're trying to deal with the thermal loads and the heat abatement that happen uh, in, in the new, trying to deal with the new workloads that we're facing today. Uh, taking a page from some, each of the, the folks up here, we talk about reducing barriers to entry, you know, making things more attainable and maximizing performance. Those are really some of the core values that we have at Scale Matrix. Some of the things that are really near and dear to our heart. Uh, we've been very, very fortunate. The company's grown significantly over the last six years. We're the leading data center provider in the Southwest market now. We have a platform that allows you to do things that you can't do in other data centers. Uh, for some of you that were on the tour uh, with the folks from Searscale who are here in the audience today, they showed you a box where there were 11 uh, servers that had eight GPU processors in each one, uh, pulling down something close to 40 kW worth of electrical load in a single cabinet. Try doing that somewhere else in the country. It's a pretty tough trick. So we really love the fact that we can do that here. Um, on the other side of things, you know, as far as breaking down barriers to entry, you know, the verticals that utilize the services that we're talking about, machine learning and deep learning, you know, they span the gambit. But in San Diego, specifically, you know, we relate back to the life science uh, and bioinformatics space. Behind me, uh, you see uh, a laboratory that's part of our accelerator program here at Scale Matrix. The building that you're in today is the Scale Matrix Life Science and Technology Launch Center. It was open just about a month ago on January 10th, and it was the brainchild of the folks at Scale Matrix, our team, when we started realizing how many of our customers were getting into deep learning or artificial intelligence, and how many of them were focused on the life science and technology sectors. As, as innovators, as early stage companies, great ideas are coming out of our market today. Uh, but some of those barriers to entry is around office space, the cost of building laboratory services, data center resources, compute resources are sometimes really hard to come by in those early days. The idea behind the launch center was to be able to provide a cradle to grave support network for early stage innovators who need a place to call home, a place where they can store tremendous amounts of data and get access to large scale compute platforms, a place where as an a la carte service, you can run in a CLIA certified genomics laboratory and do next generation sequencing operations. All the things you can do to take something from an idea to a commercial platform much, much more quickly. Um, this is not an area where Steel Matrix plans to make a tremendous amount of money. It's an area where we plan to seed the community back with something as we've done extremely well over the last couple of years. It's kind of our homage back to the city. Um, but after being here for a while, we hope that folks will learn that being able to get access to, you know, as a service compute platform like NVIDIA's new service, uh, our storage platforms, and the a la carte uh, genome sequencing services as well, are going to help idea that people take their ideas from uh, early stage to commercialization much faster. So uh, I hope you guys have had a chance to meet some of our staff today. If you have questions about Scale Matrix or would like to follow more news about the company, about some of our new platforms, sign up for our newsletter on our website, grab one of our cards or sign up, uh, we'll be happy to keep you guys informed. Thanks for coming tonight. Keep pushing the edge. The more of you that come up with great ideas, the faster that data center gets full. So thank you guys all very much. Chris mentioned the word community, and as I look around tonight, I can see that there's so many familiar faces, but there's also so many new faces. Uh, we are growing, and I can see everyone here is excited about data science, machine learning. So our goal is Definitely to join their companies if they're offering right now, but the ultimate goal is to make them feel like they need to come here to San Diego, right? That the talent exists here and they're missing out if they're not placed physically in San Diego. So that's our goal and we're going to accomplish this. It's, it's going to take several months, maybe a year or so. Well, it already happened. It already happened. We are already the center for artificial intelligence research. Many people just don't know about it yet. Okay, so that's our mission, and uh, definitely please 
Make them come. Okay, so now we're going to get to the question and answer session from the audience. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and I'm going to hand you the microphone, and you can ask our panelists any of the questions that you have. Any questions? Hi, thank you for the fantastic presentation today. I'm a student at UCSD, and my name is Dolin Fortin. So I'm just curious about what is the most challenging my customer requirement you have put back in the fields related to you. Question very right. thank you. Uh, most uh, challenging customer requirements? They can, okay, my most recent challenging customer requirement. Um, my most, okay. It's going to be in the weeds a little bit, and it wasn't really a big deal, but my mo this is because I interact with customers directly. My most recent customer challenge was actually a simple fix, and it had to do with missions on a data directory. Um, and it's only challenging because I'm remote, and I do everything on the phone, and I'm telling them command line. I'm asking them to run things through their command line and give me feedback. So <laughs> I will tell you that the most challenging thing for me is <coughs> The specific thing was a person who was telling me, I have this data in this directory and I can't load it, but I know that it's there, what's going on? <laughs> um, and you guys laugh, but, because um, it, it, in hindsight it's always funny, but at the time this poor guy probably spent like 45 minutes trying to figure out what was going on, it was just a simple permissions issue. Um, and when he gets on the phone with me, I'm like, okay, you're sure the data's there, let's double check our pass, let's do tab autocomplete just to make sure and then do a copy-paste, maybe we've got a weird miscellaneous space, or you got some back tick in there, you're not seeing my resolution in your screen, who knows. But those are the most challenging because they're, they're actually simple fixes. It's about really effective communication over the phone. You don't have TeamViewer or Google Gchat to share up. It's all about talking about things. And if you're not familiar with the command line, <laughs> you gotta take it slow. Um, I think I'm telling you, customer has always been the U.S. government. <laughs> um, Records like it has to run for six months on a battery, running a teraflop, and buried in the ground. <laughs> Locations undisclosed. Other things like, well, we want to run half the traffic of Washington, D.C. through a box that you wouldn't notice when you walk by. <laughs> so we got unusual requests, and so I said, meeting uh, inflated expectations is always a challenge. Okay, just listen to both Alice and then Douglas. Mine isn't that bad. Like, so essentially, customer come to us and say, okay, can you run for higher performance? Okay, that we can. But lower power? All right, we can do that. How about cheaper? Well, <laughs> uh, can it be free? Um, okay, so we have to stop. <laughs>